ان ادي ادو ما سنتاي ان محمد محكمه عالميه يا عدالة اي سي جي يا مركي لبعض ما انت لي ستي دعوت مركي بدا او دعي سومالي كيا و ها لبعض ما مضى و رسى سيدى هاري و محكمه دوشا اي سي فرصه لسي كارانا سومالي اي لبعض دمبانا دور دكي اسكالي هاي ان اي هدف جيسو كيس كان و ها كم كان كارانا دنا دور دكي كدي مركي اي دور دوشاكتي ان اي سبب هاي دعوت يدو أريمات نورة أوصل وهي سيء وقار خود كم إذا هاي دح دح حال عن تمحكمة ده إني سنقارش كي هاي سن كيساس كعودر ككوفي سغالي توان يدل كيدا يقال ببنان وهي هل كاسي كوسو قد بسي سوماليا ده كل يد ايا دعود ده لغي دي سنة يا وحا قتاقان إلا يو شن قريقان وعالم ياه ودفاع عايا سوماليا يقو سوو جيدي مانتي أحمد بدنا نقص أحسن إن سيدا الصومالي يدفع عيان يسير كين يعني بدأ الصومالي أوس حد جذبتي قري قانا ذا إن أدو ذا الصوماليا وإلا إيوه إن شن قري قان أو دون ذا عنك أه سوينا لغي قانو وحكم ذا إن باول إشكر أو أه قري قان خبيرة ولا شمرايك إنك حالو قلت لما ما إنه كم من يدرس كتخصص كدراسة كأول شرعية ذا لا حريرة مرن كبضة بروفيسور فيلم ساندس فيلم ساندس ودايس هو اللي حين سنجر وقرين بريتش آه وحو كتر سين هي هيا ده قرية قانة الدنيا وحو كسو قرن شبي جامعة هاتفورد إيوين يسوي كوجو لستي دعوة ذا بضن أو لنا لنا كبضة مددرنا وحو مع العلوم تا قرافك بدا كدي كجامعة ذوك يا الأمريكان كا قف كسر دحاد وبروفيسور آلان بيتس أو آه قريقان تطبيقات اللي بس نجرا ورش دلك فرنسيسكا إسلامك كان مددر كتير شرول عالم بقى وحو علوم تشرعية كبرت كجامعة ذوك تا البرازيل كدي من باريس أيوة وريجي هالكاس أيونا مددر كشقين أي شرعية ذا دنك بدا وحول التالية لنك شرعية ونقضي دولة الفرنسيسك مدة دير سوى بدها قابل سنة قفك أفراد قفك أفراد وهوين إذا كريا كجرت قريقان دودة سوماليا وقريقان ألينا ميرون ومعلمات وحكاد اكتجاع معادة أنكرس إدالك فرنسيسك وها قدنك هي كسو جيدو وها هوري يقنان ونقضي محكمة دا اي سي تي اي حد با اي سوماليا كدي فاعي سو وحا سوو كلا كسو شقي سقرا مدى مدى بي وحا هاد كمي تاي قرينا دا قيب رد دا او لسوماليا اي دعوة دا بدا يدو كشقين اي سي ادادك ودن بي ادادك ووري انت بقيب كاهيد قفك شراد وا ادوات كرين وحا او دا شدال كي انجريز كوا قرين عالمي او كتغسين وعيدة كردوان اي شروع دا عالمي اقران كوا بدا إن مدة دير عيونا سو شقي مثلاً كل واحد هري إلى التريق وها ملحوين التشالن أو لسه شقي صناديق دحي لوضع كنيو ستيت وانك لوضع كل واحد تنكي وشنطة قرن سوماري أدود هي ما أنت لو هي جديدة دفاع ذكوا أدن إني سوماري دفاعان يو هذا ودير عضي إن كان يسوها أو ما قنتها وهي كم تعين سن حب مشغولين أو سوماري بدي دي عالم يتايو لو فجي سيدا قرينك أو شيء مد سيدي هريبة ودمذي قميستو ويستمر كل أيقو سومالي بدي إذا تاني مد سكعد أو هريبة هالشيء سلوك جاري يعني إنه كجرتو حركة بدها عالمية بعد سومالي أنت إذا تاني مد كي أنا اللي قال لكن كي أي دوني شيء إني كفى إذا تهنان كدولة دا سومالي أو جدسان سيدا سنا لوجو هرتي أنا لبعض المعلومات صوص عطاء سيدي حريبة لوشة وحاسكل الدولة الدكية يعني وحل السوق يا جوان كدولة الدكية إنك استوى إيش عايزين يعني كبع قطي لكن وركر رسمي جوا حلو جان دونا حل جيد مركل الجارو يعني قاب أول هنا كي قاب قشو يعني سيدي حريبة وش عايزين ستوس كي مغناطيس إنت بق كدمنا ولصوص ولا من دونا يدو مركل لنا رنت رسم حكمة دو جوان كي وقرو واقد دونتو لما أقول لا يهدى كل واقد عيد جوش أهرع ذين التميد دق دقه عم يصدها هسا وقعان كحر المحكمة ده. Madam President, members of the court, good afternoon. It's an honor to appear before you today, and a privilege to do so on behalf of Somalia. My task today is an uncommonly uncomplicated one. 
Thanks to the elegant presentation by my esteemed colleague, Professor Miron, my path forward has been plowed, cleared, and paved. As Professor Miron has shown you, the appropriate method for delimiting the maritime boundary between Somalia and Kenya, the only appropriate method in the circumstances of this case, is the tried and true three-stage process that the court has consistently employed in its maritime delimitation cases since its 2009 judgment in the Black Sea case. Professor Miron has made it very clear that there is no reason for the court to abandon this now well-established delimitation methodology. Certainly, as she has demonstrated, none of the arguments advanced by Kenya for setting this methodology aside in favor of a different approach justifies doing so. It thus falls to me to apply the three-stage process to the geographical circumstances of this case and to show you the maritime boundary that results from it. Because the geographical circumstances are uncomplicated, so is my task. My presentation will therefore be very straightforward. It will consist of four parts. In parts one, two, and three, I will take you through each of the three stages of the standard delimitation process. In part four, I will point out the fallacies in Kenya's alternative and unprecedented approach to delimitation of the maritime boundary with Somalia, which render it untenable as a matter of law and inequitable in its application. And I will then set out the conclusion that Somalia submits you should draw, namely that the applicable law and the relevant geographical facts and Kenya follow an equidistance line from the land boundary terminus on the Indian Ocean coast to the outer limits of national jurisdiction. Madam President, stage one of the three-stage process, as the court is well aware, consists of constructing a provisional equidistance line, provided that construction of such a line is feasible and appropriate. Here, it is both. This is plain from the geographic setting. As you can see here, and at tab 45 of your judge's folders, the Indian Ocean coast in the vicinity of the land boundary terminus between Somalia and Kenya is remarkably straight and smooth, almost a straight line extending all the way from just south of the Horn of Africa in Somalia's northeast to just north of Kenya's border with Tanzania. The relevant coast for the purpose of constructing the provisional equidistance line lies within this long and remarkably straight coastline. The parties are in agreement in their definition of the relevant coast for purposes of this delimitation. They agree that Somalia's relevant coast extends from just north of Mogadishu, southwestward to the land border with Kenya, a distance of some 733 kilometers, as shown on this slide and at tab 46. Kenya's relevant coast runs in the same direction, to the southwest from the border with Somalia for a distance of approximately 511 kilometers until it reaches the border with Tanzania. Somalia initially measured Kenya's relevant coast at 466 kilometers. Kenya complained in its rejoinder that Somalia left off 45 kilometers that should have been included. In the Black Sea case, the court held that only those portions of a party's coast that, quote, generate projections which overlap the projections of the coast of the other party, end quote, are, quote, considered as relevant for the purposes of the delimitation, end quote. This was the basis on which Somalia calculated the length of Kenya's relevant coast. However, to settle what is a minor discrepancy between the parties, Somalia is willing to accept Kenya's measurement of its own relevant coast. There is thus no dispute as to the relevant coast of the two parties in this case. Madam President, as these slides show, the relevant coasts in the vicinity of the land boundary terminus are devoid 
of any obvious geographical features that might render the construction of an equidistance line infeasible or inappropriate. There are no significant peninsulas or coastal promontories, no significant concavities or convexities, and no offshore features to complicate or render difficult in any way the construction of an equidistance line. In short, the unremarkableness of the relevant coasts makes this a model case for the three-stage process and for the construction of a, provis of a provisional equidistance line. To be sure, a closer look at these coasts reveals the presence of some small islands on both the Somalia side and the Kenya side of the border. On Somalia side, here and at tab 47, you will find the Diua, the Mashiaka Islands, a few rocky islets less than half a nautical mile offshore, just to the south of a headland at Ras Kambuni. Kenya too has some small fringing islands immediately adjacent to the continental coast. They are shown here and at tab 48, specifically Kungamwini and Simambaya Islands. Helpfully, none of these small, close to shore features has a significant impact on the direction of the provisional equidistance line, nor do any of them exert an effect on the line that causes prejudice to the other party in any way. To the contrary, Somalia's and Kenya's fringing islands balance each other. This is for two reasons. First, all of these features are very close to the continental coast and they are largely aligned along it. As a result, they do not produce a significant change in the direction of the coast. Second, there are coastal base points from which the provisional equidistance line is drawn on both Somalia's Diua de Mashiaka Islands and Kenya's Kungamwini Island, which offset each other. As in prior cases, the coastal base points are determined objectively using CARA software as applied to official large-scale charts. Somalia has used United States NGA nautical chart 61220 to identify all of the base points. The base points selected by the CARA software on the basis, on the basis of US US NGA nautical chart 61220 are shown here and at tab 49. Four are on Somalia side, including two on the Diua de Mashiaka Islands and three on Kenya side, including one on Kungamwini Island. The relatively small number of base points is a reflection of the regularity of the relevant coast, which has very few turning points all quite modest, and the absence of any significant indentations or concavities. From these base points, it is a mechanical exercise to construct a provisional equidistance line, which is also produced by the Keras software. As you can see here and at tab 50, the equidistance line is almost perfectly straight. In fact, it is perfectly straight over its final 262 miles out to the 350 mile limit from Kenya's coast. This too is a reflection of the virtually straight, unremarkable coastline from which it is drawn. Another way of showing this is by rendering the relevant coast as a perfectly straight line and drawing a perpendicular or bisector intersecting it at the land boundary terminus. This is what an equidistance line would look like if the coast were perfectly straight. The similarity between the perpendicular and the actual equidistance line shown here and at tab 51 is still further evidence of the regularity of the coast and the appropriateness of using the three-stage equidistance-based methodology to delimit the maritime boundary. So what does Kenya have to say about this? In its counter memorial and its rejoinder, Kenya said practically nothing. It did not propose an alternative chart, nor did it identify any coastal base points, nor did it construct an equidistance.
nor did it challenge the correctness of the base points identified or the equidistance line constructed by Somalia. That was where Kenya's case stood as of 5 March 2021, 11 days ago. On that date, as part of its application under Rule 56, Kenya submitted a 315-page legal memorandum, which it labeled uh, Appendix 2, Volume 1. In that supplementary, supplementary written pleading, Kenya challenged Somalia's depiction of the equidistance line for the first time. First, Kenya objected to Somalia's use of the official U.S. government chart of the Somalia-Kenya coast. It contended that British Admiralty Chart 3362 is more accurate and appended that chart to its pleading. Second, Kenya determined the appropriate base points from which to construct an equidistance line based on the British Admiralty Chart and CARA software, and it supplied the coordinates of those base points. Third, it constructed its own provisional equidistance line. This slide, which is also at tab 52, shows the resulting equidistance line alongside Somalia's equidistance line, which we have superimposed on Kenya's chart. As you can see, there is very little difference between the two equidistance lines. And this further confirms the appropriateness of the three-stage process and the construction of a provisional equidistance line in the first stage. Somalia expects that the court will determine for itself which chart and which sets of base points to use in constructing the equidistance line as it and other international tribunals have done in prior maritime delimitation cases. Somalia trusts the court to perform this technical exercise and will be content with the outcome whether the court uses the United States or the British Admiralty chart or another chart that it considers even more reliable. Despite the facility with which Kenya has now identified appropriate coastal base points and produced its own provisional equidistance line, it argues in its belated legal pleading that equidistance itself should be rejected because of the purported unreliability of the base points on its own coast. Kenya suggests that only a site visit can properly determine the location of these base points. This is a novel as well as untimely argument. Article 16 of UNCLOS provides, quote, the baselines for measuring the breadth of the territorial sea determined in accordance with Articles 7, 9, and 10, or the limits derived therefrom, and the lines of delimitation drawn in accordance with Articles 12 and 15, shall be shown on charts of a scale or scales adequate for ascertaining their position. Alternatively, a list of geographical coordinates of points specifying the geodetic datum may be substituted." End of quote. Somalia and Kenya itself have satisfied both of these alternative criteria. They have each drawn a line of delimitation based on the official charts of a neutral state, which are of such scale as to be adequate for ascertaining its position. And both Somalia and Kenya have provided a list of geographical coordinates of points specifying the geodetic data. Nothing more is required. But even if Kenya's self-serving and unproven argument about unstable base points were tenable, which it is not, the solution would not be to resort to a parallel of latitude, which has no relation to the base points whatsoever, or in this case, to the actual direction of the coast. Instead, it would be to substitute a bisector for the equidistance line. That was the solution chosen by the court in Nicaragua v. Honduras, where, due to the unstable nature of the coast at the mouth of the Rio Coco, no reliable coastal base points could be determined. 
And as we saw a few moments ago, a bisector in this case, drawn from a straight line following the general direction of the relevant coast, closely approximates an equidistance line, whether drawn on the basis of United States NGA chart 61220 or British Admiralty chart 3362. Madam President, as Professor Miron explained, and as you can see directly from each of these depictions, this is not only an appropriate case for application of the three-stage methodology, it is an emblematic case for use of that methodology. If that methodology were not appropriate here in the particularly unremarkable geographical circumstances of this case, it would be difficult to envision a situation where it should be applied. There is one technical issue, however, regarding stage one of the three-stage process that remains to be addressed. This concerns the starting point for the provisional equidistance line. Somalia contends that the equidistance line, and indeed any boundary line that could be drawn, must begin on the coast, at the low water line. Somalia's position conforms to Article 5 of UNCLOS, which states that the, quote, normal baseline for measuring the breadth of the territorial sea, and thus the starting point of any delimitation, is the low water line. Surprisingly, Kenya disagrees. It contends that the maritime boundary should begin on land, some 40 meters inland from the coast, at Boundary Pillar 29. The parties agree that Boundary Pillar 29 is the final marker on the land boundary between Somalia and Kenya before the boundary reaches the sea. Its precise geographic coordinates were disputed in the written pleadings, and Kenya again complains in the legal memorandum it submitted on 5 March that Somalia has incorrectly used astronomical coordinates without converting them to WGS 84. To avoid further argument over a minor technical point, Somalia is prepared to accept the coordinates proposed by Kenya for Boundary Pillar 29. Either way, BP-29 is located approximately 40 meters inland. But fortunately, this is not a unique situation. It was common practice for colonial authorities, such as those from Italy and the United Kingdom, who demarcated this land boundary in the 1920s, not to erect such pillars on the coast itself. Their surveyors knew that boundary markers placed too close to the sea are especially vulnerable to being washed away during major storms or slowly eroded over time. Thus, the same circumstance has arisen, has arisen previously and courts and arbitral tribunals have had little difficulty addressing it. They have done so by drawing a straight line connecting the final boundary pillar to the coast at the low water line, and then by constructing the maritime boundary from that point on the coast. In Ghana v. Cote d'Ivoire, for example, the finer, final pillar demarcating the land boundary between these former British and French colonies was situated some 150 meters inland from the coast. The Atlas Chamber decided to connect that pillar to the coast by means of a straight line along the same azimuth that connected the last pillar to the one immediately before it. It then constructed a provisional equidistance line starting from the low, starting from the low water line. Similarly, the arbitral tribunal in Guyana v. Suriname drew a straight line from the final boundary pillar to the low water line and then commenced the maritime pillar 29 to the low water line on the coast and then from that point construction of a provisional equidistance line. Happily, in this case, the historical record tells us exactly how the straight line from BP 29 to the coast should be drawn. The boundary agreement of 17 December 1927 between Italy and the United Kingdom states that the land boundary extends from BP 29 to the sea in a southeasterly direction, quote, in a straight line at right angles 
to the general trend of the coastline, end of quote. Consistent with that agreement, Somalia has connected BP-29 to the low water line by means of a straight line perpendicular to the coast, as shown on this slide and at tab 53. The point at which this perpendicular line intersects the low water line is therefore the proper starting point for the maritime boundary. And it is from that point that Somalia has constructed its provisional equidistance line. The precise geographical coordinates of that point and of the entire provisional equidistance line are set out at tab 54 of your judge's folder. Madam President, in stage two of the three-stage process, to which I now turn, the court considers whether there are any special or relevant circumstances that would require an adjustment of the provisional equidistance line in order to achieve an equitable delimitation. The court and other international tribunals have repeatedly made clear that the special or relevant circumstances that could give rise to a provisional equidistance line should be geographical circumstances. The point was emphasized recently by the Itlos Chamber in Ghana v. Cote d'Ivoire, which explained, quote, according to international jurisprudence, delimitation of maritime areas is to be decided objectively on the basis of the geographic configuration of the relevant coast. And only in extreme circumstances may considerations other than geographical ones become relevant, end of quote. Although Kenya chose not to engage directly with the three-stage process in its counter-memorial or rejoinder, it did identify three circumstances that in its submission rendered the provisional equidistance line inappropriate. What all three circumstances have in common is that none is geographical, none is based, on the coastal or maritime geography specific to this case. The first of these circumstances is what Kenya euphemistically calls the regional practice. As evidence of such a purported practice, they cite just two maritime boundary agreements, both products of political negotiation rather than judicial settlement, which resulted in boundaries following a parallel of latitude. Both of these agreements were negotiated by a single state, Tanzania. One of them is an agreement between Tanzania and Kenya, to which I will return. The other is with Mozambique. These agreements are, as Professor Marone explained, race inter alios acta in regard to Somalia, and shed no light whatsoever on the delimitation of an equitable boundary between Somalia and Kenya. International jurisprudence has been clear in this regard. State practice, that is the practice of other states, is not a special or relevant circumstance that can be invoked to adjust a provisional equidistance line unless it rises to the level of opinio juris, which is not even alleged in this case. Nor could it be on the basis of just two political agreements involving the same state. The second circumstance raised by Kenya in opposition to the provisional equidistance line is what it calls the practice of the parties. The so-called practice that Kenya alleges is Somalia's purported acceptance of or acquiescence to the parallel of latitude that Kenya claims as the maritime boundary. My distinguished colleagues, Professor Pele and Professor Sands, have already shown you, as was previously made clear in the written pleadings that there was no such practice, no such acceptance, no such acquiescence on Somalia's part. Nor is there any evidence that in practice, Somalia ever manifested an understanding that the parallel of latitude would constitute an equitable basis for the delimitation of its maritime boundary with Kenya. All of the evidence is to the contrary. Like Ghana, in its case against Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya argues that even if the conduct of the parties did not rise to the level of a tacit agreement, it should be regarded as a relevant circumstance sufficient to warrant an adjustment of the provisional equidistance line. 
the Itlo's special chamber rejected both of Ghana's arguments, holding that there was no tacit agreement and that the conduct in question could not be considered a relevant circumstance requiring adjustment of the provisional equidistance line either. It ruled that if it were to reject Ghana's tacit agreement argument, but still consider Cote d'Ivoire's alleged conduct a relevant circumstance sufficient to require an adjustment to the provisional equidistance line that, quote, would in effect undermine its earlier finding on the existence of a tacit agreement. This brings me to the third and final circumstance proffered by Kenya as a reason to dispense with the three-stage process and the provisional equidistance line. It's maritime boundary agreements with Tanzania. Professor Miron addressed them briefly yesterday. I will discuss them in greater detail and I will demonstrate why they cannot be considered relevant circumstances in this case. There are two such agreements. The first, which entered into force in 1976, delimited the Kenya-Tanzania boundary only from the coast to the 12 mile limit of the territorial sea. The second agreement, dated 30 July 2009, delimited the remainder of the maritime boundary between the 12 mile territorial sea limit and the outer limit of the party's extended continental shelf entitlements. The second agreement established a boundary along a parallel of latitude. Notably, the latter agreement in July 2009 was made three months after Kenya's maritime boundary dispute with Somalia had become manifest as reflected in their memorandum of understanding dated 7 April 2009. Kenya was thus fully aware of Somalia's claim that the boundary should be an equidistance line at the time it agreed with Tanzania on a boundary that would follow a parallel of latitude. This slide, which is also at tab 55, shows in blue the notional equidistance boundaries between Somalia and Kenya in the north and between Kenya and Tanzania in the south. It also shows in black the territorial sea boundary agreed by Kenya and Tanzania in 1976, and in red, the continental shelf EEZ boundary agreed by those two states in 2009. Kenya claims that the combined effect of an equidistance-based boundary with Somalia and its own 2009 boundary agreement with Tanzania would be a cutoff of its maritime entitlements, especially in the extended continental shelf beyond 200 miles. Before examining whether Kenya, as it alleges, is significantly cut off from its maritime entitlements, it should be emphasized that, as a matter of law, it makes no difference here. Kenya's agreement with a third state, whatever its impact, is not a relevant circumstance that could merit an adjustment of the provisional equidistance line with Somalia. The court confirmed this point in its most recent maritime boundary decision. In Costa Rica v. Nicaragua, Costa Rica argued that it sat in the middle of a three-state concavity, such that an equidistance line with Nicaragua, in conjunction with its prior delimitation agreement with Panama, would produce, quote, a cutoff effect for Costa, Rica, for Costa Rica's seaward projections. Kenya's recent written submission of 5 March echoes Costa Rica's pleading. Word for word, it claims that Kenya lies in the middle of a so-called three-state concavity. The court flatly rejected Costa Rica's argument, as reflected in this sketch map from the judgment. It ruled that the, quote, overall concavity of Costa Rica's coast and its relations with Panama did not merit adjustment of the provisional equidistance line with Nicaragua. As the court explained, in considering whether the alleged cutoff was a relevant circumstance, the only pertinent question was, quote, whether the seaward projections from Nicaragua's coast create a cutoff 
for the projections from Costa Rica's coast as a result of the concavity of that coast, end of quote. Because that cutoff, the one caused by Nicaragua's coastal projections was insignificant, the court found that no adjustment of the equidistance line was warranted. As the court explained, quote, a judgment rendered by the court between one of the parties and a third state or between two third states cannot, I emphasize cannot, per se affect the maritime boundary between the parties. The same applies to treaties concluded between one of the parties and a third state, end of quote. That is precisely the situation here, and the result can be no different. Indeed, Kenya's situation is far less sympathetic than Costa Rica's. Even if the so-called cutoff created by Kenya's decision to agree to a parallel boundary with Tanzania, at a time when it was fully aware of Somalia's equidistance claim and the consequences thereof were relevant to this delimitation, which it is not, it would still not make any difference. The purported cutoff is not significant enough to the provisional equidistance line. As shown in this slide and at tab 55, the party's relevant coasts project to the southeast. The equidistance line between Somalia and Kenya follows exactly the same general direction. It does not cut off either country's coastal projection. In fact, it does exactly what delimitation lines are supposed to do, as the court prescribed in the Black Sea case. Quote, it allows the adjacent coasts of the parties to produce their effects in terms of maritime entitlements in a reasonable and mutually balanced way. End of quote. End of quote. Kenya complains that the combination of an equidistance line with Somalia and its agreed boundary with Tanzania, quote, substantially narrows Kenya's coastal, end of quote. Kenya complains that the combination of an equidistance line with Somalia and its agreed boundary with Tanzania, quote, substantially narrows Kenya's coastal from 24 kilometers to only 180 kilometers measured at the 200 mile limit, end of quote. That may be true as a matter of simple arithmetic as shown here and at tab 57, but the case law does not support the conclusion that an adjustment to the provisional equidistance line is warranted in circumstances like these. Indeed, Bangladesh was left worse off in its adjudicated delimitations with Myanmar and India after both equidistance lines were substantially adjusted that Ken, then Kenya would be in this case without an adjustment. The adjustments the two tribunals made to the two provisional equidistance lines left Bangladesh with a narrower coastal projection than Kenya would have. If the court were to adopt an equidistance line as the boundary with Somalia, as you can see, Bangladesh's coastal facade, rendered as a straight line, measures 340 kilometers, but shrinks to just 103 kilometers at the 200 mile limit after adjustment of the provisional equidistance line in Bangladesh's favor to relieve it of some of the prejudice caused by its severe coastal concavity. Kenya finds itself in a superior position to Bangladesh without an adjustment of the provisional equidistance line. It thus has no good argument for one here. Kenya further complains that the provisional equidistance line, quote, prevents Kenya from having any entitlement out to the edge of its continental shelf. That too is irrelevant. There is no right to a boundary that enables a state to reach the maximum limit of its potential continental shelf entitlement. Looking again at the Bangladesh cases, as depicted here and at tab 50, the final delimitation lines adopted by ITLOS and the Annex 7 Tribunal stopped Bangladesh's continental shelf 115 miles short of the outer limit of the entitlement it claimed in its submission to the CLCS. As the tribunal in the Bangladesh-India case observed, quote, international jurisprudence on the delimitation of the continental shelf does not recognize a general right 
of coastal states to the maximum reach of their entitlements, irrespective of the geographical situation and the rights of other coastal states. Bangladesh had a much stronger claim for an adjustment than Kenya. Bangladesh did not cut itself off by an agreement with a third state. It was cut off by the deep natural concavity of its coast, a circumstance over which it had no control. Kenya, in contrast, voluntarily shortened its own extended continental shelf entitlement by agreement with Kenya. The next slide makes this perfectly clear. In 2009, if Kenya had pressed for an equidistance boundary with Tanzania instead of a parallel of latitude, it would have secured for itself, as shown here and at tab 59, an extended continental shelf all the way to the outer limit of 350 miles. Comprising more than 25,000 square kilometers, even if the boundary with Som Somalia were also an equidistance line. Now you can see exactly how high a price Kenya paid for agreeing with Tanzania to depart from equidistance beyond 200 miles. The effect of Tanzania's Pemba Island on the equidistance line, pushing it northward, ended well short of the 200 mile limit. It did not have any impact beyond that distance. It thus appears that Kenya deliberately chose to surrender more than 25,000 square kilometers of maritime space beyond 200 miles for a gain of just 10,725 square, square kilometers within 200 miles. It is not for Somalia to criticize Kenya's choice. But Somalia insists that Kenya has no right to make it pay for the consequences of that choice by adjusting the Somalia-Kenya provisional equidistance line as compensation to Kenya. As the arbitral tribunal held in Barbados v. Trinidad and Tobago, bar quote, Barbados cannot be required to compensate Trinidad and Tobago for the agreements it has made by shifting Barbados's maritime boundary in favor of Trinidad and Tobago, end of quote. In its legal memorandum of 5 March, Kenya added a potpourri of other so-called relevant circumstances that purportedly warrant an adjustment or even an abandonment of the provisional equidistance line. In this new submission, Kenya gave particular emphasis to the alleged interests of its fisher folk and the purported need to protect its security. Neither of these circumstances is geographical and neither justifies a departure from equidistance. In regard to fisher folk, Kenya has helpfully provided us with maps showing what it calls the quote, prominent fishing grounds they frequent. Our cartographic experts have geo-referenced them and superimposed them on this sketch map, which is at tab 60. As you can see, all of these allegedly prominent fishing grounds are to the south, that is on the Kenyan side of the equidistance line. There is thus no impact on, Kesha, on, on Kenya's fisher folk. But even if quad known there were, the fishing practices of Kenyan fisher folk are not a relevant circumstance for determining the course of the maritime boundary in this case. This is because even if it is assumed that they might suffer some injury, no evidence has been submitted of any potentially catastrophic impact on the livelihood and economic well-being of the population. As this court's jurisprudence from the Gulf of Maine case through the judgment in Nicaragua v. Colombia requires before such interests can be taken into account in the delimitation of a maritime boundary. In any event, although it is under no legal obligation to do so, 
Somalia is willing to enter into a fisheries agreement with Kenya to secure the ability of fisher folk from both states to continue exercising their livelihoods in the areas they have traditionally frequented. But this does not affect the delimitation of the maritime boundary. In regard to protection of Kenya's security, it cannot be denied that at this point in historical time, the difficulties faced by Somalia impair its ability to prevent cross-border piracy or IUU fishing. But this is not a relevant circumstance justifying adjustment of the equidistance line either. Until now, the court has been willing to take account of a state security interest in delimiting a maritime boundary only to prevent the line from crossing closely in front of the state's coasts. That is not even remotely the situation here. Even Kenya does not argue that it is. Where like here, the provisional delimitation line does not cross in front of a state's coast, the court has been unwilling in its prior cases to treat the alleged security interests as a circumstance sufficient to justify adjustment of the line. Indeed, it would be a dangerous precedent to draw a boundary based on which state is strong enough to enforce it, which is what Kenya's argument ultimately boils down to. Might cannot be allowed to substitute for legal right, in this case, Somalia's right to an equitable boundary drawn in accordance with the rules of international law and the procedures of maritime delimitation that the court has consistently applied. Accordingly, Madam President, none of the circumstances invoked by Kenya, either in its formal written pleadings or its newest supplement, or as Professor Marone refers to it, Kenya's rejoinder beast, constitute grounds for abandoning the three-stage process or for adjusting the provisional equidistance line in Kenya's favor at stage two of this process. The result is that at the end of the second stage of the process, the provisional equidistance line remains intact. No adjustments are required or justified. This brings us to the third and final stage of the three-stage process. As the court explained in the Black Sea case, at this stage, its role is to check whether any disproportionality exists in the ratios of the coastal lengths of each state and the maritime areas falling on either side of the delimitation line. In its jurisprudence since the Black Sea case, the court has elaborated on the nature of this disproportionality test. It is not to determine uh, whether the provisional equidistance line as adjusted or not in stage two distrib uh, distributes the disputed maritime space proportionately, but to determine whether that distribution is significantly disproportional. In both Nicaragua v. Colombia and Costa Rica v. Nicaragua, the court explained that it is only when there is a gross disproportion that the provisional equidistance line will be considered inequitable. Unless the distribution of maritime space is grossly disproportionate, the court will not adjust or further adjust the equidistance line, and that line will be deemed to constitute an equitable boundary. By way of example, in Nicaragua v. Colombia, the court did not consider a coastal length ratio of 8.2 to 1 and a relevant area ratio of 3.4 to 1 to be so disproportionate as to render the delimitation inequitable. Here, the provisional equidistance line produces no disproportionality, let alone one that can even remotely be considered significant or gross. This is perfectly clear when the test established by the court for stage three of the three-stage process is properly performed. As I explained earlier, there is now no disagreement on the relevant coasts or their lengths. The parties are agreed that Somalia's relevant coast is 733 kilometers long, and Somalia has accepted Kenya's measurement 
of its own relevant coast at 511 kilometers. The ratio of the party's relevant coast is therefore 1.43 to 1 in favor of Somalia. The concept of the relevant area was defined succinctly and clearly by the court in its 2012 judgment in Nicaragua v. Colombia. Quote, the relevant area comprises that part of the maritime space in which the potential entitlements of the parties overlap, end of quote. This was reaffirmed six years later in the judgment in Costa Rica v. Nicaragua. Costa Rica had protected the relevant coast seaward in a way that encompassed broad areas that had previously been awarded to Colombia in 2012, and where consequently neither Costa Rica nor Nicaragua could have potential entitlements. The court rejected Costa Rica's approach on that basis, ratifying the principle of the Nicaragua-Colombia case that, quote, the relevant area comprises that part of the maritime space in which the potential entitlements of the parties overlap, end of quote. Accordingly, maritime spaces where one or both parties do not have a potential entitlement cannot constitute part of the relevant area for purposes of stage three of the three-stage process. This slide shows the maritime space where the potential entitlements of Somalia and Kenya overlap within 200 miles of their relevant coasts. All of the shaded space on this slide falls within 200 miles of both parties. It thus constitutes the relevant area for purposes of delimitation of the maritime boundary within 200 miles. This slide, which is also at tab 61, shows how the provisional equidistance line divides this relevant area between the two parties. As you can see, its application allocates more maritime space to Kenya than to Somalia by a difference of 110,236 square kilometers to Kenya versus 103,627 square kilometers to Somalia. The slide also shows you a comparison between the ratio of the party's coastal lengths and the ratio of relevant areas distributed to the parties by the provisional equidistance line. The ratios are 1.43 to one in favor of Somalia for the relevant coast, as we have already seen, and 0 0.94 to one in favor of Kenya for the division of the relevant area. The equidistance line thus allocates more maritime space to Kenya than it would merit if the distribution was strictly proportional to the ratio of the lengths of their relevant coasts. There is thus no significant disproportionality here, let alone one that is unfavorable to Kenya. This slide shows the relevant area when the area beyond 200 miles, where both parties have submitted overlapping claims to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, has been added. Here we have combined the relevant area within 200 miles and the relevant area beyond 200 miles. The equidistance line divides these combined areas by distributing 188,749 square kilometers to Somalia and 130,785 square kilometers to Kenya, as shown here and at tab 62. This is a ratio of 1.44 to 1 in favor of Somalia. This is almost identical to the ratio of the party's coastal lengths, which is 1.43 to 1 in favor of Somalia. The equidistance line thus passes the court's disproportionality test. There is no disproportionality here, let alone the kind of significant or gross disproportionality that would justify an adjustment of the equidistance, the equidistance line. Madam President, the equidistance line therefore constitutes an equitable boundary throughout the relevant area. From the starting point on the coast, we submits that this is the boundary international law requires the court to adopt in this case. I come now to the final part of my presentation, which is to bring to your attention the fallacies in Kenya's unprecedented approach to delimitation of the maritime boundary. It's so-called, quote, 
parallel of latitude delimitation methodology, end quote. Or in its most recent phraseology on 5 March, the, quote, latitudinal delimitation methodology. The first major flaw in their approach is that they have performed the delimitation exercise completely backwards. They have started at the end of the process by opening with a conclusion that the boundary should follow a parallel of latitude. This conclusion is assumed by the very nomenclature they give to the so-called methodology they have chosen to apply, a parallel of latitude or latitudinal delimitation methodology. Kenya is undeterred by the fact that neither this court nor any other nor any arbitral tribunal has ever recognized the existence of, let alone applied, such a methodology to delimit a boundary between two states. Never. Kenya illustrates how it wishes this court to be the first to do so. To begin, they draw a parallel of latitude from the land boundary terminus to the outer limit of the extended continental shelf. Then they purport to demonstrate that this preordained line distributes the relevant area proportionately. This step is not as mundane as it may seem, at least not as implemented by Kenya. By artificially manipulating the size of the relevant area, demonstrate in a few moments, they purport to establish that the parallel of latitude does divide the area proportionally. And finally, they argue that proportionality equals equity and that as a consequence, the parallel of latitude is an equitable line that should be adopted as the maritime boundary. This, as I have said, is a completely backwards approach to maritime delimitation. If this were a football match, it would be like starting with the final score, then going to penalty kicks to achieve that outcome, then playing the second half of regulation time then the first half, and concluding with the national anthems of the two sides. But this is not the World Cup. It's the World Court. And here, maritime delimitation is performed in the proper order, from beginning to end, rather than the reverse. Stage one, followed by stage two, and then stage three, before identifying the equitable line of delimitation, which is the conclusion that international law requires. That is the proper court-ordained methodology for delimiting a maritime boundary. There is no such thing as a, quote, parallel of latitude delimitation methodology, end of quote. Kenya's second major error is to presume that maritime delimitation is based on proportionality and that only a delimitation line that distributes the, mar the disputed maritime space proportionately can be regarded as equitable. This approach is contrary to the long established precedent of this court. As far back as the Libya Malta case, the court declared that, quote, the use of proportionality as a method in its own right is wanting of support in the practice of states, in the public expression of their views at the third UN conference on the law of the sea, or in the jurisprudence, end of quote. More recently in the Black Sea case, the court confirmed that, quote, there is no principle of proportionality as such which bears on the establishment of the provisional equidistance line. The court went on to explain, quote, the purpose of delimitation is not to apportion equal shares of the area, nor indeed proportional shares. The test of, proportion of disproportionality is not in itself a method of delimitation. It is rather a means of checking whether the delimitation line arrived at by other means needs adjustment because of his significant disproportionality in the ratios between the maritime areas. Yet Kenya bases its argument in favor of a parallel of latitude on that line's purported equal distribution of the relevant area as between itself and Somalia. This is a wrong approach as a matter of law, as the court's jurisprudence makes abundantly clear. And it is equally wrong as a matter of geographical fact, which Kenya manipulates to lead to its desired conclusion. Here's how they do it. As we have seen, the relevant area as defined by the court in Nicaragua v. Colombia and Costa Rica v. Nicaragua is the maritime space where the potential entitlements of the parties overlap. That area 
is presented again here and at tab 63 in the shaded solid green area. To get the result they want, Kenya inflates the relevant area, shown here as the area marked with vertical green lines, by adding maritime space where only Somalia, but not Kenya, has potential entitlement since it is within 200 miles of Somalia's coast, but beyond 200 miles from Kenya's. Kenya also includes in its version of the relevant area substantial maritime space beyond 200 miles of both coasts, which only Somalia, but not Kenya, has claimed in its submission to the CLCS. Kenya has no potential entitlement to either of these areas within and beyond 200 miles, and there are thus no overlapping entitlements there. As a consequence, they cannot properly be considered part of the relevant area. Kenya's unmistakable purpose in including these areas is to artificially inflate the relevant area, and in particular, the part of it that its parallel of latitude distributes to Somalia in order to give the appearance of an equal or almost equal distribution as between the two states. Kenya defends this slate of hand by refusing to accept that the relevant area is limited to the area where the parties have overlapping entitlements. This is what it says in the rejoinder in respect of the relevant area. Quote, Kenya does not agree with Somalia's approach of identifying the areas of overlapping potential entitlements. Close quote. This, of course, is not Somalia's approach. It's the court's approach and Somalia has done no more than give effect to it. For this, Kenya criticizes Somalia for, quote, the relevant area being incorrectly defined as the area of overlapping entitlements. On this issue, Kenya's dispute, we submit, is fundamentally with the court's jurisprudence, not with Somalia's adherence to it. Kenya defends its disagreement with the court's established definition of the relevant area by reliance on a treatise on maritime delimitation authored by Messrs. Fieta and Cleverly. Madam President, Kenya did not read this treatise carefully. This is what the distinguished authors actually wrote, but which Kenya chose to ignore. Quote, the relevant area is usually identified by reference to the overlap of the state's coastal projections extending to the outer limit of the area to be delimited, end of quote. The authors go on to explain that on this basis, maritime areas that, quote, are located more than 200 miles from one of the two states or beyond its outer continental shelf limits are not part of the relevant area, end of quote. The author's definition of the relevant area thus tracks perfectly with that of the court and with Somalia's application of it. This underscores the complete lack of support for Kenya's position in either the jurisprudence or the learned commentary. Compounding its error, Kenya repeatedly attempts to attribute to Somalia its own groundless argument that maritime delimitation must be based on proportionality. We were stunned when we saw in Kenya's rejoinder uh, but could not help but see that Kenya repeated this allegation four times within 16 paragraphs. According to Kenya, its parallel of latitude, latitude, quote, produces the almost equal division of maritime areas between Kenya and Somalia that Somalia has recognized as equitable, end of quote. Kenya even has the audacity to refer to this as, quote, Somalia's, Somalia's proportionality test. Madam President, Somalia has never recognized the parallel of latitude as equitable, nor has it ever argued that maritime delimitation law requires an equal division of the disputed maritime area. Kenya's attempt to put its words into Somalia's mouth is a classic case of what psychoanalysts would diagnose as projection. Freud described this phenomenon in his further remarks on the neuropsychoses of defense. Whatever may be Kenya's psychological motivation for attempting to shift the blame for a bad idea to Somalia, 
Our position has been consistent. The boundary must be delimited by the court's three-stage process. The construction of a provisional equidistance line is feasible and appropriate. There are no special or relevant circumstances warranting an adjustment to that line. And the equidistance line distributes the disputed maritime area in a way that is not significantly disproportionate. It thus constitutes the equitable solution that UNCLOS and the court's jurisprudence require. Somalia has never advocated that the law requires an equal division of the disputed maritime area. Madam President, in addition to all of its other infirmities, Kenya's parallel of latitude fails to deliver an equitable solution. This is what an equitable solution looks like. It is the one Somalia proposes and you have seen it before. The coast is a nearly straight line running from northeast to southwest. The coasts of the parties project to the southeast. As you can see here, the equidistance line permits the coast of both parties to project in that direction without being cut off to the full extent of their 200 mile entitlements and beyond into the extended continental shelf. Kenya is not cut off by an equidistance boundary with Somalia. Here, in contrast, is an inequitable solution. As you can see here, and at tab 64, the parallel of latitude causes a significant cutoff of Somalia's coastal projection in the part of its relevance to the boundary with Kenya. In contrast, there is no such cutoff on the Kenyan side of the line. Kenya's coast is allowed to project itself to the southeast in an unimpeded fashion. In fact, in the northern third of the area attributed to Kenya by this division of the disputed maritime area, Kenya's coast is permitted to project itself well above 90 degrees to more than 120 degrees at Somalia's expense. This is a far cry from the mutually balanced way of sharing a cutoff that maritime delimitation law requires. The bankruptcy of Kenya's approach is further illustrated by a new sketch map that was included in its written submission of 5 March. This is Kenya's depiction of how the relevant coast supposedly projects seaward. What is blindingly obvious, despite all of the busyness on this sketch, is that to draw projections due eastward in parallel with a parallel of latitude, they invented a so-called coastal configuration shown on the left, which does not even come close to representing the actual direction of the coast. As highlighted here, Kenya's imaginary coast runs due north and south at an angle of zero degrees. This bears scant relation to the actual direction of the real coast, which runs from northeast to southwest. Despite Kenya's effort to obscure it with enough arrows to fill an extraordinarily large quiver. What Kenya has done here is completely refashion the coastal geography in violation of the most basic principles of maritime delimitation. The conclusion, Madam President, is therefore inescapable. The parallel of latitude proposed by Kenya results from no known or recognized or judicially sanctioned method of delimitation. And it fails to produce the equitable boundary that the law requires. In contrast, the equidistance line, which results from the standard three-stage process the court has regularly employed in the delimitation of maritime boundaries, is an equitable boundary between Somalia and Kenya, and it should be adopted by the court as the boundary between these two states. Madam President, members of the court, this concludes my presentation. I thank you for your kind courtesy and patient attention, and I ask that you call upon my esteemed colleague, Mr. Edward Craven, to address you next. I thank Mr. Reichler, and I shall now give the floor to Mr. Edward Craven. Mr. Craven, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. 
Madam President, members of the court, it is a privilege to appear before you on behalf of Somalia. In this speech, I shall address Kenya's violations of Somalia's sovereignty and sovereign rights and the related breaches of Kenya's obligations under Articles 74.3 and 83.3 of UNCLOS. It is, of course, well established that a coastal state possesses sovereignty over its territorial sea and exclusive sovereign rights with respect to its continental shelf and exclusive economic zone. The exclusivity of those sovereign rights is expressly reflected in UNCLOS. In respect of the continental shelf, for example, Article 77 provides that a coastal state's rights to explore and exploit the natural resources of the continental shelf, I quote, are exclusive in the sense that if the coastal state does not explore the continental shelf or exploit its natural resources, no one may undertake these activities without the express consent of the coastal state. Accordingly, a state that undertakes any unauthorised exploratory activities in the continental shelf of another state violates the latter's sovereign rights. And this is the case regardless of whether the activities cause permanent physical change. The unauthorised exploration is itself a violation. This is clear from the court's order on provisional measures in the Aegean Sea continental shelf case, which held that, and I quote, seismic exploration of the natural resources of the continental shelf without the consent of the coastal state might no doubt raise a question of infringement of the latter's exclusive right of exploration. It is equally well established that judicial determination of a disputed maritime boundary is essentially declaratory rather than constitutive of a state's rights over the maritime areas which are recognised as belonging to that state. As the court emphasised in the North Sea Continental Shelf case, maritime delimitation, I quote, is a process which involves establishing the boundaries of an area already in principle appertaining to the coastal state and not the determination de novo of such an area. Accordingly, if the court accepts Somalia's position regarding the location of the party's maritime boundary, the court's judgment will have the effect of recognising existing sovereign rights of Somalia rather than creating new ones. And it follows from this that if Kenya has undertaken any exploratory or exploitative activities in the maritime space that is found to belong to Somalia, then those activities will, in principle, have violated Somalia's existing sovereign rights and will therefore engage Kenya's international responsibility. Madam President, there is no doubt that Kenya has indeed undertaken exploratory activities in the areas claimed by Somalia. Kenya explicitly accepts that it has done so. After several decades of not awarding oil concession blocks north of the equidistance line, in the mid-2000s, Kenya abruptly changed tack and began to authorise both seismic and drilling activities, knowing them to be in the disputed maritime area. Those activities took place after the dispute between the parties had crystallised. As the graphic on the screen illustrates, in the period immediately prior to Somalia's application to the court, Kenya awarded no fewer than seven oil concession blocks in the disputed maritime area to at least five oil companies. Pursuant to those concessions, several commercial operators have undertaken extensive seismic testing on Somalia's side of the equidistance line. As a result of that testing, those companies have acquired extensive data regarding the nature, location and volume 
of the natural resources contained in tens of thousands of square kilometres of Somalia's continental shelf. That data is both valuable and politically and commercially sensitive. Moreover, in addition to seismic testing, at least one oil company licensed by Kenya has drilled a well in Somalia's continental shelf. Kenya accepts that in 2007, the oil company Woodside drilled the Palumbo One deep water well in Block L5 on Somalia's side of the equidistance line. Somalia did not consent to any of those testing or drilling activities. On the contrary, Somalia made repeated and emphatic protests against those activities as soon as it was aware of them and had the ability to object. By authorising and encouraging companies to undertake exploratory testing and drilling in Somalia's continental shelf, and by disregarding Somalia's ardent to unlawfully interfering with Somalia's sovereign rights. Kenya's activities in the disputed area also violated its obligations under Article 74.3 and 83.3 of UNCLOS. And this is so regardless of where in the disputed area those activities took place. And irrespective of the court's ultimate ruling about the location of the maritime boundary, now, as the court well knows, Article 83.3 stipulates that pending agreement, the states concerned in a spirit of understanding and cooperation shall make every effort to enter into provisional arrangements of a practical nature and during this transitional period, not to jeopardize or hamper the reaching of the final agreement. Article 74.3, of course, contains materially identical provisions in respect of the exclusive economic zone. In Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, the ITLOS Special Chamber stressed that the obligation not to jeopardise or hamper the reaching of a final agreement on delimitation is an obligation of conduct, one which requires the states concerned to act, and I quote, in a spirit of understanding and cooperation, end of quote, and, and I quote again, to make every effort, end of quote, to avoid impeding the reaching of a final agreement. And in light of this, the question for the court is therefore a simple one. Did Kenya make every effort to avoid jeopardising or hampering the reaching of a final agreement with Somalia? on the delimitation of the maritime boundary? The answer to this question is plainly no. It is clear beyond argument that Kenya granted numerous licenses that both authorised and encouraged exploratory activities in maritime areas that Kenya knew were claimed by Somalia. And it is equally clear that in so doing, Kenya behaved in a manner that would be perceived by both the government and the population of Somalia as a deliberate attempt to deprive Somalia of its sovereign rights. This was self-evidently likely to hamper the reaching of any agreement in respect of the party's maritime boundary. Independent reports attest to the detrimental impact of Kenya's activities. One example suffices to illustrate the point. In its 2013 report to the Security Council, the United Nations Monitoring Group on Somalia highlighted the profoundly destabilising effect of Kenya's unilateral activities in the disputed area. The report explained that Kenya's decision to award oil concessions in the contested area had led directly to a dispute between Somalia and the holder of several of those concessions. A dispute which could, and I quote, serve to create further animosity between the government of Somalia and Kenya. 
and exacerbate tensions between Somalia and Kenya that have already been sharpened by political disagreements in respect of other territorial issues. Creating animosity and exacerbating tensions are inimical to the obligations enshrined in Article 74.3 and 83.3 of UNCLOS. Kenya's principal response to Somalia's case has been to assert that the dispute with Somalia did not crystallise until 2014. As Somalia has already explained, that position is completely wrong and is contradicted extensively by the documentary record. As Professor Sands has explained, since as far back as the late 1970s, Kenya was aware that Somalia claimed an equidistant maritime boundary. Somalia never disavowed that position. Kenya's claim to the contrary is directly contradicted by its own statements, including at an earlier phase in these proceedings. In its preliminary objections, Kenya acknowledged that the dispute already existed at least half a decade before 2014. According to Kenya, it was only in 2009 that Somalia first disputed Kenya's 1979 EEZ boundary. And similarly, the Memor Memorandum of Understanding, which the parties concluded in 2009, expressly referred to the existence of a maritime dispute and contain no fewer than 11 references to the dispute or disputed areas. Kenya's principal argument is thus fatally flawed. Kenya's other line of response is to assert that no violation can occur where the activities in question are merely transitory in character. This argument also lacks merit. Article 77 of UNCLOS prohibits all unauthorised exploratory activities in Somalia's continental shelf. It draws no distinction between unauthorised activities of a permanent or transitory character. A temporary interference is still an interference, and particularly where it results, as here, in the permanent unauthorised acquisition of sensitive data concerning Somalia's maritime resources. Secondly, the case law cited by Kenya does not establish that Articles 74.3 and 83.3 can only be violated by activities that have permanent physical effects. Nor is there any mandate in the language of those articles for such an interpretation. What matters, as the Special Chamber recognised in Ghana Côte d'Ivoire, is whether Kenya has made every effort to avoid jeopardising or hampering the reaching of a final agreement with Somalia. In the context of the existing dispute, Kenya's decisions to award oil concessions in maritime areas claimed by Somalia and to permit and encourage the carrying out of extensive exploratory tests in those areas plainly fell short of that exacting standard. And thirdly, and in any event, Kenya concedes that not all of the activities in question were transitory. On at least one occasion, a well was drilled on Somalia's side of the equidistance line. Thus, even on Kenya's approach to the law, the standard enshrined in Articles 74 and 83 was indisputably breached. Madam President, the consequences of Kenya's unlawful acts are straightforward. In accordance with international law, Kenya is obliged to cease its wrongful acts so as to respect Somalia's sovereignty and sovereign rights. In particular, it must cease to award any oil concessions north of the equidistance line, and it must annul such concessions as it has purported to grant. Although Somalia is entitled to substantial reparation from Kenya, in the spirit of amity and neighbourliness which Somalia hopes will characterise the party's future relationship, 
Somalia does not pursue a claim for reparations for past wrongs. Instead, Somalia asked the court to do just three things. First, to affirm unambiguously the existence of Somalia's rights. Second, to recognise the violations of those rights that have occurred. And third, to order that Kenya shall cease its wrong flags and take all necessary steps to terminate any measures that violate the sovereignty or sovereign rights of Somalia. Madam President, Somalia is one of the world's poorest countries. Following years of civil conflict and humanitarian disasters, Somalia's maritime resources are one of its few valuable assets. Unfortunately, they are also among its most vulnerable. Somalia has brought this case before the court in order to obtain vindication of its sovereign rights over those resources, which are critical to its future development and to the future security and prosperity of its people. As the preeminent guardian of the international legal order, Somalia looks to this court to ensure that its sovereign rights are effectively protected for the benefit of all of Somalia's people and in accordance with established principles of international law. Madam President, members of the court, thank you all very much for your kind attention. In accordance with our understanding of the statement at the start of this session, Madam President, this concludes Somalia's presentation today. I thank Mr. Edward Craven, whose statement does bring to an end today's presentation of Somalia's oral arguments. I wish to recall, as mentioned at the opening of today's session, that the court yesterday received a letter from Kenya and a response from Somalia that present the possibility that the oral proceedings will continue beyond today. The matter is currently under consideration by the court. Once the court has taken a decision, the registrar will inform the parties as to the further conduct of the proceedings. For this reason, the reading by Somalia of its final submissions will be deferred to a later date. I shall now give the floor to Judge Benuna, who has a question for Somalia. Judge Benuna, you have the floor. Je vous remercie, euh, Madame euh, la Présidente. Je vous me permettrai de baisser mon masque exceptionnellement pour que je sois entendu. Je parle sous, sous votre contrôle. Euh, ma question euh, s'adresse à la Somalie. Je souhaiterais que la délégation somalienne clarifie sa position au sujet de l'affirmation du Kenya dans son contre-mémoire, selon laquelle la borne numéro 29 à Dar es Salaam, qui représente le terminus de la frontière terrestre entre les deux parties, doit être reliée, je cite, dans une direction sud-est jusqu'à la limite des eaux territoriales, le long d'une ligne droite à angle droit de l'orientation générale de la côte à Dar es Salaam, laissant les îlots de Diouwa, Dama Siaka, en territoire italien, fin de citation, ceci conformément à la, ceci conformément à la description générale de la frontière prévue dans l'accord de 1927, voire à ce sujet le contre-mémoire au paragraphe 33 et 35. Ma question est donc la suivante. Est-ce que, selon la Somalie, cet accord établit la ligne de délimitation, je parle de l'accord de 1927, Est-ce que cet accord établit la ligne de délimitation 
de la mer territoriale entre le deux, les deux parties et, si tel est le cas, quelle serait la limite extérieure de cette ligne Je vous remercie, Madame la Présidente. I thank Judge Benuna. The written text of this question will be communicated to Somalia as soon as possible. Somalia may respond to the question in writing no later than 10 a.m. on 22 March 2021. The registrar will also convey the question and Somalia's reply to Kenya. Should Kenya wish to make any comment on Somalia's reply, in accordance with Article 72 of the Rules of Court, its comment must be submitted no later than 10 a.m. on 26 March 2021. This brings to a close today's session of these oral proceedings. The seating is adjourned. <laughs>